Hello, welcome to the Research Cat. Today I want to follow up on the communications piece that we did uh, in the last video that I posted on, uh, on the content. There I was mostly talking about communication models that had to deal with uh, uh, the spoken word. But today I want to do one on written word and particularly we're going to be looking at a um, at a letter that was written uh, as an apology letter. I think that apologies in general people are not really that great at. Um, I have had to write in a uh, course of business um, and as an educator, I've had to write formal letters to both students to apologize for something, um, a potential miscommunication, for example, or in business to customers. Sometimes things are just out of the control, but the customers like to know that you still feel apologetic, even if you're not sorry, because sorry indicates a um, usually some sort of a blame. And there is a difference between having regret for some situation having happened and having sympathy for the customer or the student, but uh, a difference between that and say guilt, which is where I've said something that has offended the person, which in fairness, I've done that a number of times too. I find that people that say that they're not sorry for anything that they've done are either out of touch of reality or um, they haven't done enough. Because if you, just by the action of doing something, for instance, if you're teaching and you're going out into classrooms every single day, you're going to say some things that are going to potentially offend other people. That may not be that you've intended to do that, but people may misunderstand for instance, of what you're going to do. So we're going to take a look at this letter. Now, before I begin uh, the letter, I just want to point out a few things that this is Word um, in the uh, current 2020 uh, model. Now, I have EndNote on it. We've gone over EndNote in another video, but this is the references generator that I use. I have Grammarly. In Grammarly you can adjust goals and it's a real easy way to set up. So I'm doing in this particular, I have a fictional letter um, which is a business letter. I want to keep it formal and I want it to be knowledgeable for the audience of who the person is going to. And so there's a couple of things that you can do and you can turn on various things including a plagiarism checker and when I'm going to do a uh, a paper for say a school or for a uh, study then what I'm going to do is turn on the um, uh, plagiarism just to check and make sure that I'm avoiding anything that may be a problem. Now, in this particular case, um, the letter that I'm going to be presenting is a fictional letter. It's actually a story hook for a Call of Cthulhu game uh, that I'm uh, going to be running pretty soon. So this is actually a handout that would go to the, um, uh, to the players. But because it's an apology letter, it's going to get like double duty and it's going to be able to be posted up here too. So first of all, depending on your relationship with the person that you're going to be sending the letter to or that you're going to be apologizing to, it may be formal or it may be informal depending upon that relationship. In this particular case, it's uh, Kita, who happens to be working at uh, Miskatonic University in Arkham, which is a fictional university in a fictional town of Massachusetts. And um, he's sending it out to 
um, his boss in the university. So we want to keep it very formal. The other thing is that you have to decide whether or not a um, on an apology a letter is worthwhile. Um, typically when I have to do an apology I usually write a letter simply because I can think about the wording. All right? If, for instance, um, if I have an issue with a uh, another instructor who misconstrued my intentions, this has happened a few times, um, largely because I tend to be relatively sarcastic mm -hmm. as a person, and not everyone understands sarcasm, um, which I know is a problem, um, and I still do it, so I suppose that's entirely my problem. There are some people out there that are humor impaired. The fact that they do not understand what I am saying is my problem. Um, I run across people sometimes who will say, and it's not just students uh, or, <laughs> or uh, um, customers, it's sometimes my peers who will say, well, this is just the way I am. People have to deal with it. Mm, no, not if you're in a public persona. In my personal life, yes, because I can choose not to associate with those people. That's fine. Um, if you don't like me as I am, fine. But when I have a task or a role that I have to perform, now I'm going to need to make sure that that is understood by everybody. So in this particular case, I went with a formal letter and um, I'm just going to turn on the date. Now the next thing is that you're going to have is a uh, heading. This is the address. Now some people will put the date between the two and if you look at business uh, models of letters that's actually more correct. However, having the date on the top uh, which is less common um, is actually really nice if you're flipping through a paperwork trail and in this particular case uh, my character Kita is actually trying to create a paper trail and so having that date on the top makes it much easier to be able to uh, create a paper trail of what's going to happen. These are letters very similar to what I have sent to insurance companies in the past when I have a large number of letters and I need to make sure there is a record trail so that this might go to the lawyers or to an employer or just to the insurance company itself again. Then there is an inside address. The inside address is whoever you are sending this to. In this case, it's going to be Mr. Ravencroft. And we have a uh, salutation. The salutation is what, who you're sending this to. If I didn't know who this was going to, if this was going to be just Arkham Public Safety and I don't know the person's name, I'm going to do to whom it may, con may concern. Um, however, in this particular case, I know who this person is because I made them up. Now, in a letter, you typically want to keep it short, to the point, express exactly what you want. If it's a formal letter like this, you stay out of the slang. You don't have the can't, won't, um, don't have the... Uh, various um, uh, nicknames or uh, street slang that you might use in your everyday conversations. In this case, this is a formal record that's being sent. Now, Kita is a doctor of biology, and so you want to sound appropriate to what you happen to have. 
when a student sends something to me and they're a first year student in an associate degree, I don't really care that much about, um, it's nice that they sent me something, that's wonderful. I don't care that much about the tone. And anything that I can get on a formal tone, great. However, when it comes to, say, a master's student or an early doctorate student, and now they're sending to apologize for something, um, even an email that they've sent because they've misquoted somebody, and that happens. If you're a prolific writer, or you're working on your dissertation, which is hundreds of pages long, and you have forgotten a uh, quote or you've assigned the quote to the wrong person, you may have to acknowledge that. Well, you definitely should acknowledge that. And you may have to write an apology to either a professor who's bent out of shape about it. It is their job to be that bent out of shape about it. Or to a peer reviewer or to a company if it wasn't published in that format. Um, because in that case, yes, the journal should have caught it, but it is your writing. So you want to keep the tone for what it is. Now, if Keita was sending to his, um, his friend, uh, Jennifer, well, that's a different story because that's going to be an informal apology letter that, oh, I'm sorry I missed our date last night. Um, I got caught up chasing zombies. But in this case, that isn't the case. The other thing is I usually tell students and, and I tell uh, the customers when I'm doing a, uh, a tutoring session to be careful of how much information you give. When you're writing a letter, if it's a long rambling letter, the chances are that you're giving a lot of information that is not pertinent to the situation. And this is one of the reasons that I personally prefer to send a letter as an apology out rather than a, um, a send, a, send a uh, contact the person, talk to them on the phone. Um, that has its place, but you might send something that you haven't thought about uh, for it. Or you might say something and actually deepen the hole further. There's actually a couple of common traps, and this work uh, comes from the uh, author, uh, uh, Dr. Suzette uh, Haddon Elgin. She's actually a linguist, well, was a linguist. She died in 2015, uh, had a PhD. She did two dissertations, um, the first student out of the University of California in San Diego to do that. She's written 31 linguistic books, to the best of my knowledge, along with eight songs. Uh, six po published poems, 17 short stories, and 16 science fiction novels. So I feel that her qualifications for being able to talk about the written word is certainly there. Um, she gives three common traps that people do, and she has kind of funny names for them. You can always read the book. Um, the book is titled The Gentle Art of uh, written self-defense, and I'll put that down in the notes down below, mm -hmm. along with a uh, list of her published works. But one trap that people fall into is when they say, I couldn't have done whatever it is that I absolutely did. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's not me. I don't do those kinds of things that we have video or tape or everybody in the room heard you say. What you're actually asking the person to do when you say, well, I wouldn't have done that, is you're actually asking the person to say, well, yes, you heard me say this, now I want you to ignore that I said what I absolutely said. Um, which is 
you're asking sort of a collective belief and you're not apologizing. That's not an apology. That is a, well, I wouldn't have done that. So therefore everybody should ignore it and we'll just go on with life. Um, if it's a person or entity, they're going to be potentially offended because you've made the situation worse. The next uh, part is that you're gonna shift the blame. Well, yes, I said it, but it's not my fault. The reason that you're upset is because of X, Y, and Z. Or, well, yes, I said that, and this person reported, but we know those people aren't uh, reliable. Well, that's still, you said that, right? The part that place is not reliable um, is not part of the argument, right? You're shifting the blame. You're saying, well, I did it, but I don't want you to think about what I did. I want you to think about what all the other places are reporting and let's blame them. Rather than say, yes, I did it. I shouldn't have said it. You can actually go another step. You can say, well, I can't believe that I did that. I'm just worthless. And you can like grovel and say, I'll never be able to look at you in the eye again. You're also not apologizing. And you're still shifting the blame, but this time you're gonna shift the blame with guilt. Um, in the general art of communicating with kids, uh, uh, Dr. Elgin talks about the, um, or I, I guess I should say, Dr. Elgin talked about the use of uh, guilt to try to escape consequences, um, both from the viewpoint of a child and from the viewpoint of an adult in that dynamic, that it creates stress that you don't need to do. Instead, what you want to do is you just want to state the facts. And that's the first paragraph of the letter, is that Kita was down by the river, he's stating his facts. On the night of May 3rd in 1932, I was at the river with a peer. We were in a discussion of our latest scientific project and thought the early night air would be stimulating. To the best of our recollection, it was around 4 p.m. when we heard a yell from the northern bank. We responded and saw a shambling man with a green pallor who was attacking another young man jogging along the footpath. After pushing the thing into the river, we contacted the local authorities and answered questions put to us by the Arkham Gazette. Those are the facts. Now, the reason the date is in here, along with the time, is because this is a formal letter that is being designed to be able to set up a record. When I actually present this module, there's going to be, I think at this moment, seven letters that the investigators can find between uh, Daniel Ravencroft and various entities that will kind of suggest that perhaps Mr. Ravencroft is not being forthcoming with the authorities on what is exactly going on. So this sets up a timeline for it. It's just facts. There's no apology in here. This is what happened. The apology portion comes next. Now, one of the things that Dr. Elgin writes about uh, in her book is that you have to try to avoid putting yourself into a trap. If you say, I am going to, um, well, let's use an example directly from her book. Someone asks you, um, are you going to stop cheating now? There is, that is a question be, that has no good answer. If you say, yes, I'm going to stop cheating now, you have already answered the question that has been a presupposed by the accuser, which is, you were cheating. 
Or if you say no, that could mean then you're going to still continue cheating, right? So people will do that to themselves. They will say, I did this. I did not read your letter, right? This is actually what has happened because Kita arrives home from the meeting, right? When I arrived home from the meeting, I saw your correspondence that if anything weird happened, I was to inform the authorities quietly and keep a low profile as to not bring unwanted attention to the university. It was not my intention to ignore your directions or to make your job more difficult. If this had been, Kita had said, I didn't see your correspondence. Well, maybe he didn't see the correspondence because Kita is going to be admitting that he doesn't read the various letters that come from the university. Having worked in a school, I can tell you that my email is constantly filled with various letters, many of which I have to keep track of. Um, so telling them whoever it is that you don't read the correspondence from the school, not necessarily a great way to sound. So instead, and who knows when the correspondence was said? If he had said, when I arrived home from the meeting, I saw your correspondence that I received last week, this would be a problem. So just keep it blank. In this case, let Mr. Ravencroft decide when that correspondence arrived. It's 1932. We can't guarantee that letters come on the right time. They don't always come on the right time now. Now, one of the things in here is he's not saying, I'm sorry. And that's because Kita has regret not an actual apology. He's not going, Kita does not want to take the blame for this. So the next part is the actual apology section. This is the, what I would call the excuse. Um, what uh, Dr. Elgin calls the presupposition. And then down here is, in the future, I will avoid unnecessary confrontations with the press. The modifier in here is because the Kita may have a confrontation with the press later. I have had to write business letters that were far more serious than this where I had been told by my boss, do not go and talk to this customer about this. And I've sent a letter out and I've put modifiers in exactly like this because if that customer talks to me, what exactly am I supposed to say? Oh, well, I can't talk to you and answer any questions because my boss won't like that. At that point, I'm living in a Scott Adams cartoon of Dilbert. I don't want to do that. And the customer is going to get angry at me because I'm not answering the question and I am right there. And my boss is going to get angry because there should have been another way. How come you were there? So this way, if they say, you said that you were going to avoid the confrontations. No, I said I was going to avoid unnecessary. I was not going to seek out confrontations. I was going to modify it in some way so that it is not an unavoidable this is what's going to happen. I followed up with the medical examiner, Miss Angleston, and she reported that no corpse was brought in by the police. If you need her contact information for future references, I can provide it as she is a dear friend because she is Jennifer Angleston and she is Keita's girlfriend. And I know this because I made them up. This part is this is, I have regret for what happened, but also I'm going to throw you a bone so that 
Um, and being that this is in Call of Cthulhu, it is not a literal bone. I'm going to throw you a little bit of a hint for something so that Mr. Ravencroft can talk to somebody about this if he needs to, which will also bring Kita in, since Kita's investigating this. Although he doesn't want people to know that. Then you have the formal name here is Valediction, but you have the closing. In this case, sincerely, um, it could be thank you very much. I tend to send ones as thank you. Somebody has sent me some sort of a, um, a letter letting me know about something that's going on. And so I'm going to say thank you for that information and put it down in here rather than up here. And then also we have the signature line and then type down at the bottom. Now, sometimes I run across people who, who write out um, and they put their masters and their associates and all of these in the bottom and you can certainly do that. And if you have a title, that should go down here. But it's not necessary, you would what I typically do is put down here in the bottom the parts that have to do uh, the titles and the degrees that have to do with the information that I'm sending out. So I would put down, if this was my letter, I would put down the EDD after my name because that's the highest degree. And if it's something about teaching adults, I might put down the MAED. But I rarely would put down the associate degree, um, have the associate degree in science for multimedia and website development, unless I was sending out to a website company, then I'm going to include that information too. Um, personally, I prefer simple and not giving people a ton of information about it. So this would be the letter out here. Now when I write a letter, um, and I did the same for this letter even though this is a, uh, a fake letter, um, I guess one could say it's actual fake news, is that I have Grammarly open for it and I will check through and I'll set up the the type. If I was to put in here a can't, um, it wasn't my intention. What should happen is that the um, Grammarly, when it does its next check, should find it. So it didn't because, of course, I wanted to demonstrate it at this point. And so it's not going to do that. But in actual fact, it's done pretty well in the past when I said that I want to do formal and do it. I would probably have to refresh the page as I think about it um, because I have an overlay sitting on top of it for the recording. When we apologize and we're sending communications out, you don't have to apologize for things that are not your fault. And I personally do not apologize for things that I'm not sorry for. Um, sometimes I will be called out uh, by pretty much anyone. And they'll say, well, you didn't apologize for uh, not saying hello to me in the hall. Correct, because I didn't hear you. And I'm not going to apologize to you. Um, you didn't apologize because you assigned uh, four days of homework and then you didn't give me extra time to do it. Right, that's your problem. Um, your, bad, your bad timekeeping does not come into it. Students, I have found, oftentimes want teachers to apologize for things that are outside of their control. 
Um, I can have regret, I can have sympathy, and I might write a sympathetic letter. I might write a letter that expresses regret for a situation that occurred. But I'm not going to take the blame for something that is outside of my, uh, my purview, outside of my field, um, of whatever that situation is. But conversely, if I'm going to apologize, and that does absolutely have to happen at times, then I'm going to apologize and move on. But I don't want to apologize and then have to keep apologizing for the next 10 years. This is actually one of the problems that I have with the news cycles at this moment because we have people who um, in public view have said things that are pretty stupid to have said. Um, I'm sure you can think of a few. I don't actually need to, to specify them at this moment. They shouldn't have been said, but they were. The person has given a sincere apology. But we don't move on. Right? Now, they should be called out on it. I think that you should call out bad behavior. But you don't need to run bad behavior into the ground. Now, if the person apologizes, and this has happened before to me where I've had a, um, a peer apologize and say, you know, I shouldn't have said that. Well, I don't accept their apology because this isn't the first time or the third time or the 15th time. It's like the 26,000th, literally, time that they have done the same thing. And then they come over and say, oh, I apologize, don't worry about it, it won't happen again. And I'm like, I don't believe you. You know, those are, that's a different case. But if somebody has, even in the public view, yes, they should know better, they've apologized, they've been sincere, then just let it go. Move on. And sometimes you're going to find that people won't, won't move on. Um, in school and in professional, uh, in my professional life, I have, uh, and by the way, as a student, I would send formal letters that were very similar to this sometimes inside of my emails to professors if I screwed up somewhere, um, or to a peer, partly because of the record, partly because if you're actually writing a letter to someone, you're taking the time, and it's generally understood. You're taking the time to be sincere about apologizing about it. I'm also taking the time because I want to think very carefully about what happened. Possibly when I'm writing this block up here, which is the statement of facts, I'm going to realize like, hmm, you know, I didn't, this isn't actually my fault. As I start to think about it, I'm not going to take the blame for what a colleague did. Why am I being grouped into that? And I've had to write those before too, where my employer will say, well, collectively, all of you are wrong. And I'll put the block up here, which is, on the day in question, I was in my classroom for the 12 hour period because we had an over time. I was not at the meeting. because don't blame me for something that I wasn't present for and had no part of, and only learned about in the end, and didn't talk to people about it. I found that the book, um, uh, the General Art of uh, Written Self-Defense, which is how to 
write letters. Uh, by the way, there's about 200 letters towards the end, which are sample letters for various things, including this is actually uh, based on a template from, uh, although she did not actually write about this, but since she wrote 17 science fiction novels, I would like to think that uh, she would have been okay with a, uh, a science fiction story being written in letter form. But this kind of, uh, uh, these kind of letters were quite helpful. I've used the book con uh, considerably. There's a few things about it that I find uh, need a little bit of extra explanation, but it really breaks it down to keep it very simple and to make the communication very, um, uh, very concise and very clear. I hope this was helpful and potentially mildly entertaining. Um, you can always give me a like down into the bottom and uh, subscribe. And I was uh, unable to post in the last week. Um, there's a gap. I, uh, I guess I have to do my own apology there. I can have regret. Um, I broke several discs in my back. My advice is please don't do that. And so I have continuing medical issues with that. I will do the best that I can to be posting twice a week, but um, there may be times where I simply cannot do that. Uh, we're going to be starting on the next uh, week a new content area and I want to go through on applications of the difference between studies and uh, studying as a student and homework. They're frequently confused and they actually have different applications and then a couple of studying strategies. I'm not really going to get into like what you should eat or you should rest before. We'll mention those briefly but I'm a little more interested on the um, the aspects of creating a generalized strategy in order to study um, because and I'll be addressing this in the next video but people are very inefficient in studying so um, students will study far too long um, as a reference point this letter took me about five minutes to create the script took maybe 15 minutes and then the recording is the 40 minutes so you want to try to keep your time down um, people's time is valuable and so that's really what the next uh, content area is on when you're doing your studying and you're doing your homework to not waste a lot of time and get very little return back I hope that you will join me next week take care